called this year my uh, my Oscar presentation is the server birds of a feather so it will be all software but just to make sure that I don't disappoint I brought an interesting piece of hardware that arrived in our office just yesterday actually Jared was kind enough to bring it because I was a little bit absent-minded and I forgot it there um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, it's so uh, we'll start with that so we can remove the camera there. This is the infamous orange box that we were using at the OpenStack conference. We actually have quite a few of these. I think closing on 20 now, but something like that. Yeah, you could. Oh, yeah. Okay, so for those of you that haven't seen it before, this is a cluster in a box that Canonical has custom manufactured for our sales engineers so that they can go and demo anything that we may do on a cloud. It actually is pretty cool because it makes it real to the customer. It's fine to talk about clouds in abstract, but when you put one down on their table and you show that it actually works, the discussion is very different. It is also pretty much the ultimate demo machine because you have your entire network, you have 10 machines in a single box, and you can put, you can put the connection to the outside world, outside of the company perimeter. So they don't need to give you access. You can go with the wide area modem, uh, seller modem there, pair it with the orange box and just not bother their IT team at all. Now, before, before I go into what the box is, I want to be clear on the purpose. What we do with these, besides technical demos, is that we do training with them. We're not suddenly in the business of selling hardware. Also, as you can imagine, this is low volume custom, custom manufacturing. It is a pretty expensive device. In fact, um, I was joking earlier that I had to uh, do quite a few phone calls to convince people that was okay to give Jerry the box. He wasn't gonna run away with it. Um, but these just arrived yesterday, so our office team hasn't figured out all the protocols around them yet, which is creating a bit of confusion. <laughs> this is the third revision, we call it 2.1. We send them back to the manufacturer every once in a while for upgrades, minor or major, and fixes because these are most of the time all on the road. And even though they're very robust machines, you know what kind of suffering that entails. Okay, so. Let's take a look. Oh, normally, I should free that side. Normally, this would be something like this. So you said that's an expensive way to buy CompuTon, is that because of the package for portability? 
It's an expensive way to buy compute units. You, you wouldn't want to build a data center out of those <laughs> because no. it's, you're, you're paying extra for the portability? You are indeed. The, the device is custom manufactured, which makes it expensive. Then uh, when I show you what's inside, you will also understand why you won't build uh, a data center this way. But for the aim of being portable, it's very hard to beat this. One person can travel with this in their checked luggage and go any place that they need. Sometimes they need to cross, cross customs, but other than that, there are no particular problems. <laughs> <laughs> no PSA hustle? I, I think not so far. More customs trouble than PSA. We're also having a new test to hire sales engineers, which is arm strength. <laughs> 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 they can lift two of those. They are it. Um, if there's a, for a French custom, what are the unsolders and the microchips to give examples? This is actually uh, quite heavy because it's basically a heat sink. The, the case itself is the heat sink for all the machines. Looks the same on the other side. And the compute units are, are aligned on the sides so that they write the directly here. If we turned it on, you would see blue LEDs on the sides, and you, which are the reset pins for single units. So this is fanless? It is fanless, except for uh, the switch. Nice. Last time I saw it, the switch was not fanless. Oh, we're probably going to use this in one of our OpenStack sessions, but today it's here just as hardware, as interesting hardware. Now, on the rear, there are network ports. They go to the switch and USB ports that go to uh, Node 1, I believe, and the video, actually Node 0, and the video for Node 0. There is power that feeds in our box and power out in case you want to uh, slave uh, a monitor to it. And there is a power button. <coughs> Up here is uh, a wireless connector, so somewhere in the kit there is We'll install it just to make it look good for Jabber's pictures. So the first provision didn't have wireless, but we learned from our experience. On the front, there are a bunch of LEDs. one per node, so you can see whether they're on or off, since we usually do demos where we provision the cloud from bare metal, so we want to see them come online as the installation progresses. Um, handles, as you can imagine, are necessary because of the weight, but there is another purpose to them, which is that when you're working on the inerts, of the device, it's really convenient that you can rest them on the handles. So, I'm going to do that for the camera, but this is how it looks inside. Five nodes per side, plus the switch, plus the custom power supply that feeds everything. Four storage, um, four SSDs <laughs> for extra storage for certain nodes, which are the storage tier. <laughs> okay. And this is where the handles really come handy because then you can do this. Don't mind me. I just saw it pop up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's all working. Is there another outlet over here somewhere? Uh, what, do you like what are you looking for? Place to plug in the camera. Two outlets here, they're both used. Over here. Where? 
step or not? That can reach all the way down there. Oh, it's great. It's all the bits and hands. It needs to be big. Yeah, right. We tweak. It's no books. It's all over there. It's got to go to China. I'm trying to see. So we don't have the usual hardware invasion, but there is some hardware that we need to look inside. So I can rest it here. And. Can, can we use your power strip? That's going to be too clear. Well, well, let's do this. We'll run the laptop. We'll run the laptop off battery until we're done with the, with the camera. That's fine. Uh, yeah. This way you can. That's fine. Uh, I need this only at the beginning. So I'll use the laptop from battery at the beginning. And then we'll okay. the camera. Oh, you want that outside? Um, oh, yeah. Actually, it's probably better to do the opposite. The computer on the side screen and the projector on the And this is VGA. So. Uh, do you yeah. have scissors and screwdriver? Or um, any MacGyver around here? I need this off right here. It's oh, it's interfering with the yes. Wow. Mac Iver. Oh. We can turn it. Thank you very much. So you want to call for Gizmo board? Put a beach bug in where the camera is. Type of pizza is actually on the side of the box, oh, okay. but it's written in pen, so it's hard to see.
You can sit next to it. Yeah. Oh, Pizzas are written in ink on the side. Bill, there's no confusion on your order. Thank you, sir. You know, now since you have uh, initiated yourself for the pizza, you have to come to more meetings. <laughs> now that I'm actually a student here, I can come to all of them. You could have come to all of them uh, before you were a student. Well, it's kind of hard convenient. West Point. <laughs> it's a bit of a commute. West Point? Yeah. No, West Point. Oh, West Point. Okay. It's a bit of a commute. No, if you're out. It's only one Wednesday a month. Yeah, they wouldn't let me borrow the suit top I think what Jerry's trying to tell you is it's always good to have a friend in the airport. Hmm? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. always good to have a friend in the airport. It's the Jets in I wasn't in the Air Force. Uh, airborne. Oh, airborne. Airborne. <laughs> you were here, Cap. I, w I was in the Army. I was Two to six, uh, in an aviation battalion. GPU and, uh, and CPU is unified memory access, so you want to get the PCI test to do it to share, share the job. Somebody had noticed you get this thing uh, called HPL for our uh, wife and I. Yeah. For us, so HPL for our and they said, well, this isn't a permit. I was like, okay, uh, yeah. so you do well, some goofy stuff to me. I don't know what the office is. But anyway, so, so, yeah. So, yeah. 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 so, and the guy you don't have an expert on, apparently, is very hard to get hold of. He occasionally posts to developers. And even if you can reload it, he's a couple of times. 
never finished that cross. Way back for the PCI no, I, I device and touch, but, which I'll let you have later on. Uh, uh, board flat well, which you can buy the operating system. I don't know if it needs to be raised. open. I so, so you have a building? How many blocks have not? So I have a different job. Let's see if it's changed. I'm pretty sure it has to be. So it's not really the way. That was, that was just the basic part of it. I don't see any way to get around it. I'll show you the end of the sandwich. I'll put it in the cloud. I'll buy the invitation on the block. Yeah, but that's what you're doing. So you're selling it to a lawyer. It's on the list. Yep. The application is on the list. The problem with it is invitation. Well, oh, we have to see if you can get the lid map. Yeah. Well, the sun has the safety and security chips. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
since I was a little bit busy lately, I, uh, I, in, I am inadvertently pulling a little bit of a bait and switch on you. Maybe it's not fully inadvertently, but uh, because the abstract that went out was nondescript as to what I would be speaking about, and I usually speak about hardware. While this year my uh, my Oscar presentation is the server birds of a feather, so it will be all software. But just to make sure that I don't disappoint, I brought an interesting piece of hardware that arrived in our office just yesterday. Actually, Jared was kind enough to bring it because I was a little bit absent-minded and I forgot it there. Um, <laughs> yes, um, it happens. So uh, we'll start with that, so we can remove the camera there. This is the infamous orange box that we were using at the OpenStack conference. We actually have quite a few of these. I think closing on 20 now, but something like that. Yeah, you could. Other Okay, so for those of you that haven't seen it before, this is a cluster in a box that Canonical has custom manufactured for our sales engineers so that they can go and demo anything that we may do on a cloud. It actually is pretty cool because it makes it real to the customer. It's fine to talk about clouds in abstract, but when you put one down on their table and you show that it actually works, the discussion is very different. It is also pretty much the ultimate demo machine because you have your entire network, you have 10 machines in a single box, and you can put, you can put the connection to the outside world, outside of the company perimeter. So they don't need to give you access. You can go with the wide area modem, uh, seller modem there, pair it with the orange box and just not bother their IT team at all. Now, before, before I go into what the box is, I want to be clear on the purpose. What we do with these, besides technical demos, is that we do training with them. We're not suddenly in the business of selling hardware. Also, as you can imagine, this is low volume custom, custom manufacturing. It is a pretty expensive device. In fact, um, I was joking earlier that I had to uh, do quite a few phone calls to convince people that was okay to give Jerry the box. He wasn't gonna run away with it. Um, but these just arrived yesterday, so our office team hasn't figured out all the protocols around them yet, which is creating a bit of confusion. <laughs> this is the third revision, we call it 2.1. We send them back to the manufacturer every once in a while for upgrades, minor or major, and fixes because these are most of the time all on the road. And even though they're very robust machines, you know what kind of suffering that entails. Okay, so. Let's take a look. Oh, normally, mm, I should free that side. Normally, 
normally this would be like this. So you said that's an expensive way to buy compute funds. Is that because of Packers for portability? It's an expensive way to buy compute units. You, you wouldn't want to build a data center out of those <coughs> because no. it's, you're, you're paying extra for the portability? You are indeed. The, the device is custom manufactured, which makes it expensive. Then when I, when I show you what's inside, you will also understand why you want to build uh, a data center this way. But for the aim of being portable, it's very hard to beat this. One person can travel with this in their checked luggage and go any place that they need. Sometimes they need to cross, cross customs, but other than that, there are no particular problems. <laughs> <laughs> no PSA hustle? I, I think not so far. More customs trouble than PSA. We're also having a new test to hire sales engineers, which is arm strength. <laughs> 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 they can lift two of those. They are it. Um, and if there's a uh, French custom, one of the unsolder some of my microchips to give examples. This is actually uh, quite heavy because it's basically a heat sink. The, the case itself is the heat sink for all the machines. Looks the same on the other side. And the compute units are, are aligned on the sides so that they radiate directly here. If we turn it on, you would see blue LEDs on the sides, and you, which are the reset pins for single units. So this is fanless? It is fanless except for uh, the switch. Nice. Last time I saw it, the switch was not. Oh, we're probably going to use this in one of our OpenStack sessions, but today it's here just as hardware, as interesting hardware. Now on the rear there are network ports, they go to the switch, and USB ports they go to uh, Node 1, I believe, and the video, actually Node 0, and the video for Node 0. There is power that feeds the entire box and power out in case you want to a uh, slave uh, a monitor to it. And there is a power button. <coughs> Up here is uh, a wireless connector, so somewhere in the kit there is. Oh, there we go. We'll install it just to make it look good for Jabber's pictures. So the first provision didn't have wireless, but we learned from our experience. <laughs> On the front, there are a bunch of LEDs. One per node, so you can see whether they are on or off since we usually do demos where we provision the cloud from bare metal, so we want to see them come online as the installation progresses. <coughs> um, handles, as you can imagine, are necessary because of the weight, but there is another purpose to them, which is that when you're working on the innards of the device, it's really convenient that you can rest them on the handles. So, I'm going to do that for the camera, but this is how it looks inside. Five nodes per side, plus the switch, plus the custom power supply that feeds everything. Four storage, um, four SSDs <laughs> for extra storage for certain nodes, which are the storage tier. <laughs> okay. And this is where the handles really come handy because then you can do this. <coughs> Oopsie. I think I pressed one of the buttons. I hope it didn't mess with your software. Actually, didn't the recording work anyway? Oh, okay. So, there is 
let's see, maybe higher. And light, there we go. Custom power supply. There's a switch, you can slide switch. And there is a stack of drives for the storage. Okay. The The nodes themselves, oh, this is actually a pretty cool shot, too bad you're not recording it, <laughs> are lining the sides, as I was saying, for the CPU on the outside. They are all Intel nukes, which was a certain ver variant of the board that has uh, AMT on board, so that we can, uh, we can do power on, power off from software. That's, that's what... Um, in the selection. These have quite a bit of RAM, so they work quite well for us. Then if you look at the last part of the chassis, let's see if I can make it bright enough somehow. You can see the switch. This is a D-Link switch that actually has VLAN capability. So you can actually configure VLAN. Elevate the camera, okay, for something that you would just have to elevate it. Or maybe we can try and show that. What's the amount of RAM per computer node? Should be 16. And switch is a 1 gigabit switch? Oh, yeah. What? It's about to be drilled here. Any CPU has 8 cores? I can't. Uh, all CPUs are has well. <coughs> Uh, the spec sheet up there, if I convince my mouse, there we go. So there are 10 nodes, there is a single power supply, the LEDs are already explained. <laughs> Funny that the weight is in there, but yes, it's heavy. Um, so it's an i5 with 16 gigs, and each one has 120 gigs as an SSD drive on board. Uh, if you know how the nukes work, they have a space for um, for uh, an insert of our GPU on board. Obviously they have gigabit. Four of them have those additional drives that I was pointing to. And the, the, the first node has the Wi-Fi and access to these ports. These ports, the network ones, are wired straight to the switch. In case you actually want to run the box in, uh, in non-headless mode, there is an HDMI port right there, also from the first node. And this is pretty much the view that we were looking at. Is the case a heatsink? It is. So the case you has no heatsink of its own, it's just pressed against the, the side? <coughs> That's right. So <coughs> the nukes are on the sides. The, the Intel chip is on the facing side. There must be some thermal paste, but it's literally touching the side of the case. And um, which is why there is this combination of design and function of the reset switches, because the reset switches are on the other side with a blue LED. So when, when you turn it on, you see these blue lights coming out, exactly where the reset switches are. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, there are these magnets that were meant to attach the bottom plate, but currently we're screwing it in rather than, rather than messing with that. Start from zero and be able to come up secure. And to do that, we want a secure mechanism to provide a seed to randomness. Now, we do it. We have a, a place that's called entropy.com, which is entropy as a service. Well, it's randomness as a service. But the, the server, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. The server that uh, delivers that is open source and it's public. <coughs> so going back to the, to the NSA jokes that we were making before, you can run your own, set, up, set it up on your network and you have your local source of randomness that, that your security officer is not going to fret about. 
This way we can cover both scenarios. The server is very simple, it's less than 50 lines of code, so you can even, even audit the code and see that there is nothing funky going on there. Um, um, question. Obviously the randomness if, should if be you, coming from a good source, like if a hardware source. If you don't have any entropy, how do you create a secure connection to the entropy server? Uh, that is very good. Very good. <laughs> yes! Do you need so this the connection? If, I know if, the connection is observe, less secure. If I observe you fetch your seed, I know the initial state, and thus I have a better chance to predict what the random numbers of your next connections are going to be. Uh, no, no, no. The the download is is covered by TLS, but how is that done when? There is no randomness. If there That's is no randomness, the TLS is going to be born and half compromised. Could be. Because, because we know the uh, non-random contribution of the uh, first party. But, but you could generate it locally, right? Well, the whole point of this is that you can't trust random numbers generated that early. There, there's, there's no entropy <coughs> in a virtual machine. There's none to harvest. But, but you could you could get it from the underlying hardware, like Intel AMD both support. If you uh, if you assume okay, that but this is this is a VM that's the problem. It, no, no, but but you can virtualize that through your virtual machine. Right, right. It's, it's in the hardware on the the physical hardware. Yeah, I I think that there should be more of that, but that also brings you back to the NSA paradox, like the that, that, I that think the previous the guys have gone parallel saying that they cannot AMD trust Intel. Implemented it without NSA contributions. <laughs> um, and B, um, are, are willing to require that you only virtualize on such hardware. Um, there are a lot of people who, in the open source crypto world, who consider closed source random number hardware um, to be scary as all hell and would much rather uh, have a uh, uh, biased diode they can read. Because they don't in, trust in, your biased diode not to be biased by somebody else. Okay, I can see that point. But but yeah, the, the hardware implements um, the random number generator as a biased diode going through an LFSR. Of, of course it does. Yes. And um, the, the question is, were, were the engineers that did that design a competent from a, not just a mathematical, but a crypto-mathematical point of view. And if they were that competent, who were they really working for? Because we know who employs the majority of mathematicians that are actually competent in that specialty. That's a valid point. That's a valid point. Oh, and so that's good enough for the phone company, but it's not good enough for a bank, if the bank is adequately current. So I have to, I have to look at how the PLS is set up. I'm pretty sure that there is no weakness knowing the person that designed this. If, if the, but TL, if the TLS the is forcing a much bigger uh, number of bits so that even if all of its bits are compromised, the host's contribution to the entropy is enough to make it a high security connection, it might fly. I think but that there are two uh, there are two additional aspects from what I remember. But, but um, you know, basically, one is that what you get back gets passed through some kind of additional washing on your side, so that you are not literally using that number. Of course, it does. But, but um, that but that's except for the entropy gained through that handshake, everything is deterministic. Right. And we can predict what comes out the mincemeat grinder from what went in. Right. And the other aspect would be that you are adding to the entropy pool of the machine. You're not overwriting it. So in a worst case scenario, you are no worse than before. You know, worse than before may not be good enough. And if we're telling people this makes it good enough, it damn well better be. So the, the, the sanctity of that TLS connection needs to be demonstrated. Good point. So I'll, I'll learn about that. Where is broke here? TLS and shake with no randomness. 
okay. You're, um, you're, you're doing exactly what you're trying to protect from. Mm, not exactly, but yeah, I see your point. Okay, so where were we? Uh, randomness. It's, it's still better than the alternative because in the alternative you have nothing, nothing right? Or, 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 or you're trusting that sneaky Intel bio. Or you could have a situation where it's simply that the system is secure. Uh, there were some SUSE appliances that were built properly secured, but they wouldn't boot because they couldn't generate the key. They would sit there waiting to generate the key, waiting on randomness that was not available. Um, yeah, the swamp was secure, you just couldn't get any work. It's fully secure, it's just not useless. Um, well, that's the only fully secure system there. <laughs> that's right, that's how security works. So, uh, then there is CCOM, which limits the... You can use that facility to limit what system calls are available uh, to a process. Then there is the mandatory access control stack. You have these options. Obviously, a farmer is the one that we prefer. Dark green means it's in main. Lighter means, uh, actually, there is a mistake here. This should be dark now. Lighter means that it's either in universe or not, uh, not default. Um, then there are encryption solutions for LVM or for encrypted directories on your system. It used to be that encrypted LVM was in the alternate installer, now it's in the main installer, which is why I'm saying that part yeah. here should be like dark green. Um, EcryptFS, as I was saying, uh, encrypted directories. Then, um, stack and heap protection from the way you compile things. So by default, they will be compiled with, with that sort of, uh, of tree, tricks. Um, I don't know how much detail, how little detail I should put here. So stack protector would put canaries in the, in the call stack. So if someone is trying to play a stack overflow, that would be overwritten and it would be noticed that something is, is amiss. Similar story with heap. Pointer obfuscation makes it harder to guess where a pointer is going. So that it's hard to write the code that such an overflow we, would use. And this is compiled into GDMC. Um, then there are a whole set of, of uh, memory space restrictions for stack, libraries, exec, and so on. And um, I believe built as as Pi is, yeah, it's enabling your executable to be protected the same way. These are not only interesting because they are there as default configuration. If you use the tool chain, they're also interesting because the entire Ubuntu archive is built with these options, right? Uh, Fortify source is one that I didn't know. It's interesting. It actually switches things in your code. If you do things like printf without, if you use a string operation that doesn't say this many characters, it will change your code and switch it with the call that includes the number of characters. It will do a few other uh, swaps in the code of that kind to, uh, to close uh, common exploits. Uh, Relvro, I don't remember the verb bind, now resolves all library linkages at start of the executable, so they're not exploitable later. Non-executable non memory, this is a property of the, of the chip, but we're using it. Uh, there is some emulation in, 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 in Intel environments, even when the chip doesn't have it. I'm not sure why we cannot emulate in AMD environments. Um, every, every 64 bit AMD chip has. Oh, then, then it's why. Then the, the table is misleading. It should be saying something else. Not, not, not necessary, but not, uh, not applicable. Okay, I'll fix that. Um, well, maps so protection means because you could use the information in the memory map to do some of this pointer crafting. Try to hide the memory map if you don't need it. These are 
most of these can be turned off by going into the right place in the um, in sys or proc and flipping a bit. But you're not supposed to get there unless you are a super user. So I'm sorry, Bill, were you saying something? No, I'll lay away. All right. Symlink restrictions, hard link restrictions, these are so that you cannot do privilege escalation by following a link um, where you go from being one user into being another user at the end. And this, this will stop you from linking um, under those conditions. Huh. P-trace scope means that you won't be able to P-trace unless you're a privileged user. Uh, this protects some memory in the kernel and these do the same for different parts of the kernel. Uh, there are uh, blacklists for uh, kernel modules, which are pre-populated with, uh, with network protocols that uh, are not used, like A25. All their protocols that are rare. So uh, there are two things. One is modules that are blacklisted by default and you have to activate um, if you really want to use. The other thing is that you could just tell the kernel do not load modules period unless I flip this bit first. Uh, that is, uh, oh, blacklist rare protocols is the one that I was describing. Block module loading is the one where you, you block module loading. Um, more things about modules. Uh, Syscall filtering is similar. I'm not sure what's the difference with. Uh, okay. I'm not sure why this is listed twice. It's similar to CCOM. It is using CCOM. So it's just a reduced set of syscalls for certain processes, which was up here. have to ask what's the duplication there. fixes were not. Um, Daniel Branch from Red Hat commented saying, funny how the closely developed patch in the quiet period was shown to be faulty just as soon as it was given to the community, pointing out to the fact that someone in the canonical security team basically said immediately this is broken, we need another patch. Uh, that's the only place where I've heard this mentioned, so I assume that we had the same as everybody else. Um, anything else on security? All right, so. I'm going to have to read through all that stuff. It is, uh, it is an interesting read, and I'm going to make a, a, a slide for each one of those. So if you, if you wait a month, I can send you the deck. I think I can just read that page. <laughs> hmm? I think I can just read that page. Oh yeah, you, you can do that. But my version will be prettier. Um, okay, let's go Which for something. I'll, I'll criticize your typography. <laughs> <laughs> you usually criticize my screenshots, not my typography. So, oh, well, um, in your magazine article, the typography isn't your choice. Oh, yes. But I get any dashes, so I'm satisfied. As well you should be. Um, all right, so let's go for something lighter than that. So there were a bunch of upgrades in 14.04, obviously. Tomcat 7, Oscars 9.3, MySQL 5.5, KVM 2, Libvirt 1.2.2, two. Two, two. Soup of numbers. 
it's pointless to track it this way. Um, interesting, I would say, is that we shipped uh, open v switch to Wo, which is uh, which is basically the default for a network virtualization that's used in OpenStack. So that, that is nice. LXC has finally reached 1.0. The server team has been doing container work over the years. I think that uh, the unsung heroes of the container space are basically parallels and canonical. In a, in a few months you will hear that this was all done by Docker. You're already hearing it now. And a few months after that you will all hear that it was done by Red Hat. So, but containers are something that's been adopted by Canonical a long time ago. And as such, the, the experience there is very polished. For Docker, what we did was uh, creating standard images so that if you want to spin up, rather than a single process, the entire image, you can do it in a way that's conforming to the other images that, uh, that we provide for other clouds. We try to make sure that the Ubuntu experience is as consistent as possible. We run into problems where uh, some vendor with a very big name would be making their own kernels and then uh, the next upgrade for the kernel from Canonical would have broken their thing and brought down all of their users. That happened, we got blamed. Um, because the users don't know better and they expect it to work. So we make sure that as much as we can, the images that pl public cloud vendors are shipping, if they're called Ubuntu, they need to meet certain standards and we are certifying to those. Um, and so we're extending that story to Docker. If you have been following, not in terms of certification, but in terms of making standard images, just like we make uh, standard images for for clouds. Uh, if you have been following the recent announcements out of the Red Hat Summit, you, you can see that they are starting to do something similar on their project Atomic. And I'll let someone from Red Hat cover that in my future talk, but it, it was an interesting evolution. Um, There are a couple of uh, technology bits that are worth going into um, separately from anything else. One is the installer. So we have what we call the curtain installer in the latest versions of the server. The curtain installer is image based. So uh, the design mandate is to be brisk and fast and unceremonious about it. When you go and say install, it just does it as fast as imaginable. When, you co when we compare it on our development hardware, we get that the curtain installer beats the post process of some enterprise class hardware like an HP server. It takes us less to install an Ubuntu server than to run the BIOS chip. <laughs> so that, that works quite well. On, on spinning media, it may take a couple of minutes. On SSDs, it takes 35 seconds in the development environment we have, which is nothing fancy. It's more of a property of the SSDs. The major difference is that Curtin uses an image that basically is one of our cloud images, and that's what's being used for the install. And then after that is completed, we can go and depackage any alterations. Like, you need a special driver. OK, we'll go and put it in. Uh, that process is so much faster and um, it is not something uh, that is new, I think. Uh, we have been doing it on the desktop for a while. Uh, SUSE was doing it also. It's, it's not new, but it's good for us to bring that from the desktop to the server because it is very applicable to the process of spinning up new images. If someone wants a new, uh, a new Ubuntu virtual machine spun up on, on a cloud, the, and the speed of installation could be relevant. Ideally, they're Particularly going, if you're responding to load. Ideally, they're not installing. They are just using a blank image, and this is no factor. But still, if there is an installation required, being fast is good. And if you're in the Azure cloud, where you're not the default operating system. Azure is interesting. So initially, we were 
puzzled, and then we learn to love it. It's, um, but you're still not the house brand operating system. Yeah, we're not, but we're happy because uh, because we went there early and played ball with uh, with Microsoft. We basically have 80% of the Linux usage there. And, so, and that's a good position to be in. Right. But, but of course, that is less than half of the you're, you're You're going to spin up a new instance is probably not going to be a Ubuntu sitting fallow. I think that we don't have too much problem in spinning up. I, the last complaint I heard was spinning down on Azure was, was painful. <laughs> but I haven't followed up. Either way, it, so far it's been great. Uh, I would say that right along with AWS, it's, uh, it's been a great environment to be in. Surprisingly, because it's something that was not built to be infrastructure as a service, right? Um, Complementary to that, there is another technology that's called Simple Streams that we introduced in 1304. And then we backported to 1204, and it's obviously in the LTS now. Simple Streams provides data about images. And the idea is that it feeds information to our tools. And that's what we consume it for. But conceptually, it's a metadata service that says, for that cloud, you need this image. For certain clouds, we do a custom data stream. For other clouds, it would go off the standard data stream. But you pick the, the data stream that's applicable, and then you get additional information about the image so that you can automate, from the point of view of a cloud provider, things like in, in installing new images in their system. Instead of having someone having to do it manually, they can look at the data stream. Oh, there is a new update of the image. That's wget that. Check the hash put it in glance, well, that would be the open stack way of doing it, of course. Nice. Um, so that, that actually is quite important because we refresh the images that we give public clouds on a very uh, regular basis to eliminate to eliminate vulnerabilities in the base image. So if I were an aggressor, that stream is where I want to uh, insert the uh, uh, broken half of my broken image. <laughs> yes. But it's pretty much secure in the same way as package downloads are, so that's, that's not a different type of, of security scenario. As long as you don't like pull a Symbian and lose your sign key. Yeah, as long as you don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the caveat with all security. Yes. So uh, Simple Streams is a is, uh, simple technology, but it's quite helpful there. There is a third component that's older, but it's probably the one that's permeated the most, which is CloudInit. CloudInit is, um, is a way we can inject operations into an image as it boots. So um, this is also a, a cloud-driven technology. You are always spinning up the same image, but the resulting machine must be different. It must have a different host name, must have a different IP address, um, you probably want to import keys for the user. You want to do all of these activities. You might need to install certain packages. So CloudInit um, supports these operations. Um, basically, there is a blob of user data that's attached to the boot of the, of the image. And this gets parsed as the machine comes up. So that if you're setting a password, that is up before the network is up. If you are installing a package, obviously that cannot happen before the network is up, but it will happen as soon as that is possible, and so on. Um, that makes it also possible for us to always start from the same image. We don't need to customize the image. We can do certain customizations on the fly, even if they are repetitive. That doesn't, uh, doesn't change the game. There are two types of blobs. One is uh, user data, and the other one is vendor data. But that's probably too much detail. There is, there is um, most documentation on the wiki. It is interesting because you can play some interesting setup games, not just at the cloud level, but also in your provisioning instances in your, in your um, small environment. Maybe not at the same level as Vagrant, but you can, you can spin up different uh, setups that are right from the beginning instead of having to go in there and, and set those names or other properties like that. Um, 
architectures. So we have been supporting ARM, x86, Intel, and AMD, uh, 32 and 64. We've been supporting ARM 32 since uh, 1204 LTS. We first shipped ARM uh, in the 904 release, but the first time we offered it uh, in an LTS was 1204. Now in this LTS we have added ARM 64 bits, which is a little bit early in terms of most people gaining access to the, um, to the hardware, but it's useful for developers. And we have added uh, Power 8 in cooperation with IBM. And it's little and the power it. Um, Bill, I didn't know you were a fan of power. Where, where you've been the last 10 years? <laughs> well, I noticed occasionally, but I never realized it was so pronounced. All right. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's up. Mm. Virtualization, we have KVM running on ARM, and we have XCN also uh, running on ARM. Well, I think KVM is more actually. You need the hardware support, of course. Um, so you need the MP core board that, uh, the ARM A15 MP core board that Kurt has right there, or, or something more powerful than that. But if the hardware can do virtualization, we have KVM for you. Um, now I'm going to impose on you with the kernel <laughs> for those of you that like it and for those of you that don't like it I'm going to put you to sleep um, so things that have changed in the kernel are always a mountain but I was going through the list and trying to pick what's interesting. So I'm going to go through uh, the ones that I thought were interesting. With, uh, so the kernel that we're shipping is 313. It's interesting because um, we've been shipping a three kernel for a while. Uh, 1204 was shipping 302. SUSE has also been shipping a three kernel for a while. Uh, but Red Hat is going to jump to a three kernel this year. So. Uh, this year, it's finally the three kernel everywhere. Uh, RHEL 7 should be shipping 3.11, we're shipping 3.13, but going back to the backboards uh, discussion, I don't think that that's much of a difference. <laughs> um, so what, what is in 3.13 that's interesting? Um, shipping with 3.13 was multi-queue block layer. So the queues for block I.O now are on two levels. Before, there was a very, uh, there was a single course uh, lock over the IOQ, which meant uh, systems with a lot of CPUs would overwhelm that theoretically. Um, you wouldn't get, you can overwhelm that from the CPU side. The problem now is that the IO side can also uh, be able to deliver what the CPU is expecting and the problem is in the kernel because of, the, of that lock. So that's being reworked instead of having a single thing that was basically a bottleneck at around 800,000 IOPS. Um, now there are two, le uh, two levels of queues, one queue uh, associated with each processor where the AO requests go in and then those get merged into a second layer where the queues are per hardware device. This design uh, theoretically or with some practical experiments but not real hardware as I understand it has reached um, should be able to deliver uh, several million IOPS so it's probably what Fusion IO was waiting for <laughs> um, if you're not buying in Fusion IO class hardware that probably was not a problem but um, but it's nice uh, that is significant performance and has been down the road um, uh, support for the Intel mic architecture has been merged upstream in 3.13, so if you want to run cards that look like a cluster, the um, uh, Knight's Corner or Knight's Landing boards, those are supported upstream. Um, <coughs> there are a bunch of TCP options 
that have been turned on by default over the last few uh, three versions in 3.12, in 3.13, TCP fast open, and earlier, 3.5, 3.6, there were early retransmit, connection repair, fast open, on both client and server. These are now part of the default kernel configuration upstream. So those are interesting changes. They are not default often more. Uh, there are being tweaks to multi, um, similar to what I was discussing for the for the IO queues. Uh, the MD driver for for software RAID has been optimized for uh, RAID 5 when many cores are available or multiple cores are available. Then that I believe came in 3.12. Yeah. Um, uh, those of you that read the stuff that I like to write, uh, I will uh, like this one. So the out of memory, the out of memory handling has changed in 3.12. The uh, famed um, OM killer is half of half is its job. So starting with 3.12, your OM killer does not trigger if you make a syscall that would generate a memory request that cannot be satisfied without killing something. Instead of calling the OM killer, the syscall will return, return no memory. And because, <laughs> and um, um, the reviewer had a very nice comment that this will absolutely not be a problem because the the quality of error checking on Cisco return code paths is superb. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we'll see. Um, that is one. The other one is, uh, what if you hit the page fault? If you hit the page fault, the usual out of memory uh, killer applies, but there is a change. Instead of ca calling the, the random killer, you will back down the entire process that got you there so that you are not holding any of the locks that you would have held in the past. Then call the OM killer. It does its job and then when the OM killer is done freeing some memory for you, you will roll up that stack again saying I'm going to get all my locks back and do the operation that produced the outer memory again. That is supposed to reduce many uh, deadlock operations that are otherwise possible. Um, in 3.11, there was a new option for, this is the Federico Hit Parade, the list is obviously much bigger. Uh, in 3.11, there is a new O temp file for, um, for open and related system calls. So you can open it as a temporary file to begin with instead of doing create a file and then unlink it, unlink it, unlink it, uh, and it will come out just right. Uh, it will never show up on the file system and it's better practice security wise than, well if you're unlinking it, it was fine, but this way you have a clean path to do it. Uh, something that I really want to play with, but I didn't have time, also in 3.11, is Z-Swap. Uh, instead of swapping a page, now there is code where you can take that page, compress it, and put it in an area of RAM that's a dedicated page cache. It's basically in RAM swap, but instead of, um, instead of saying I'm taking it from here and putting it there, which would make no difference, Taking it from here, I'm compressing it and keeping it there. For a certain type of workloads, that could eliminate swapping altogether. I, I want you're, to. You're, you're, you're swapping to compressed RAM as opposed to. That's right. Swapping the SSD. And then if you run out, it's a cache, right? So if you run out of that, you go to, to swap as usual. So that, that would be an interesting thing to experiment with. Uh, B cache, which came in 3.10. Is interesting that is basically support for using SSD as a cache layer for your file system. Uh, ZFS has a similar thing, but it is, um, or it is, it was, it is. Um, ZFS has not gone anywhere. Um, it was file system um, 
specific. This one, it does not care what file system you're backing it with. Um, you won't cache sequential AO, it's just trying to do it for random. It's, it's interesting, another thing that it would be interesting to experiment with. Um, then uh, there are other things that you have seen in the interim releases, like Kurt probably has seen Big Little enablement that came in 310. So it was it was already released last year, but now it's in PLTS. Um, one that I did notice because it was my pet peeve is that in 3.6, suspend to disk and to RAM at the same time became a mode. So now, theoretically, the Mac and the Linux machine can be just as good in terms of when you close it, it goes to sleep the best possible way. Um, I think this Dell is already doing it correctly. I have to run a few checks, like pulling the battery and things like that. But um, I cannot pull the battery, so it will be a little bit more complicated. But I think. Um, that was really an annoying thing uh, comparing, well, initially even Windows, but now only Linux desktop to Mac. The fact that when you shut it off, you wouldn't have the, the return from RAM response or you wouldn't have the security of getting back from disk. You had to choose one. Um, obviously, there are a lot more kernel things, but th these are the ones that stood out to me as interesting from the last LTS, mostly. Um, I'm supposed to say a lot about LXE and Docker, but that will be in the, in the final presentation. <laughs> we can actually have a session on either one, but I, I won't go into that right now. Any questions? Yes, sir. Can you explain a little bit more about uh, directory encryption? Uh, you mentioned that you know, before. Right, so EcryptFS would support that. Um, I believe you can, yeah, you can do home directory encryption as well. It, it doesn't have to be just a data directory. It used to be an install time option. Uh, actually, I need a table. Where is it? doesn't seem to be, because it's light green, I doesn't seem to be the default install anymore. Yeah, it's a pre-seed option, but it's it's not something that it's exposed there. I guess that encrypted LVM took over the, the options block, but it still works, it's just it's not the primary option. I have to say that while I'm obsessive about security not on other fronts, I'm not particularly in terms of encrypting the file system. Depends. Now I'm going to get the near full. Depends whose data you've got on your file system. I think that's fair. So that's fine. I don't have any state secrets on my file system. Or anybody's social security number except your own. I don't think even my own. So that works. All right, other questions? All right, then we'll call it today or night. Thanks.